Yeah, hello and welcome to the PML School. Uh, today I'm presenting an exercise about transduction modeling and the assessment of the number of transit compartments. Um, you may know uh, that this is actually our 20th session of the PML School, so this is really the last one within the series that we originally planned for. Uh, so after today's session, we have reached our natural end. However, um, based on the overwhelming feedback that we received over the uh, previous um, events, um, we decided to continue with another series this autumn. Uh, more about more details about this at the end of today's presentation. So in this last session uh, of our series, we also change our source of examples. As you know, in previous sessions, we used to pick an exercise from the book of Gabrielson and Weiner. And today we are going to use a literature example. And uh, literature examples should also pave the way uh, for the future seminars, for the future sessions where the source of models for all the forthcoming series should be literature examples. Uh, for today's example, the original article is free to download from the publisher. So you may want to read that after, after the event. And also this time, this is also different from previous sessions, I can provide the full Phoenix project file uh, and could upload it to the user forum. That would include the data set, the model, and all the analysis that uh, we will do through the demo. Uh, so these files will be uploaded uh, to the user forum, the link to the reference, and the link to the recorded session. Also the recorded session will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. Um, as usual, during the presentation and the demo, um, please feel free to post your comments and questions into the Q&A panel on the right-hand side of the WebEx console. So this is the source of my exercise today. This is an article published by Lena Friberg in 2000. And Lena has developed a semi-physiological uh, semi model on animal data where rats were treated with 5 fluorouracil and the white blood cell count, or better, the leukocyte count, was measured as a sort of side effect response to a um, common uh, anti-cancer treatment. Uh, one of these, the aspects of the, this article um, th uh, that makes this a very interesting exercise is the curvature of the response, which shows a significant rebound of the leukocytes after the treatment. Let's have a look at the data later, but um, I'm presenting the problem description before. So uh, there were 24 rats randomized into three treatment groups and one control group with six rats in each group. Um, this exercise will actually focus on a single group, in a single treatment group, where rats were given a single 5 fluorouracil injection of 170 mg per kg on day zero. And this was followed by blood sampling over 120 minutes, or if you will, two hours, with a sampling interval of 15 minutes. Uh, for the PD data, blood samples were collected on day one before the injections and on day two for half of the rats. Then in all rats from day three to day 23 or 25, when the leukocytes were considered to have returned to baseline. So this is um, the problem description. Now coming here's the data. Uh, um, the semi-log plot of PK data on the left. Let me show this with a laser pointer. A typical IV uh, uh, bolus curve. Uh, however, I mean this is you know you would think uh, one compartment, a simple one compartment model. But since we are modeling um, you know, literature data, maybe I should share this view. Where is this? Let me show this. So this is actually the the, um, the literature reference, uh, the, the article. And uh, what I did here is actually I did a, a digitization of the of the data that were included here, 
And then what you can do in order to um, get to initial estimates, you can just go to the results and see what uh, the, the author has come up with some, some data. So in this case, uh, there was previous data on PK of 5 uracil that shows uh, capacity-limited elimination. So uh, with our simple one-compartmental IV bolus model, we have to take care of this. But this will, we will be showing in the demo. And here's the PD data, which shows, you know, a, a decrease of, of the leukocyte count based on the, the drug treatment. And then after five, six, six days, um, the, um, the leukocyte count increases again, a little bit higher than the baseline, and then decreases once again. So we have here this uh, typical rebound effect. But uh, there's maybe one thing also that you should note about these two plots, and that is the difference of time scales. You see uh, here we are spanning two hours over the PK data, whereas in the um, PD data um, we are spanning tw 25 days. So we have to um, measure, um, yeah, we have to model some, some delays. And, you know, this is something we've done quite a bit over the last sessions. So uh, let me um, do a quick review of uh, what we did there. So, for example, on May 11th, uh, we had a session about effect compartments. Uh, this is the most simple approach to model a delay between concentration and response. Um, and as you know, the effect compartment here denoted with a block with CE, uh, it's, it's placed between the central compartment and the Emax block. And you have to um, mo um, estimate one additional parameter that is KE0. Uh, that's the rate constant that governs the flow from the central to the effect compartment. Then we had a very interesting sessions on March 16th, um, where we compared three different uh, um, de um, delay model models, if you will, the link, which is just another expression of the effect compartment, turnover model and receptor binding models. And uh, just recently, over the last three or four sessions even, uh, we tried a lot of different versions of a turnover model, so you should be pretty familiar with those. Finally, on April 13th, uh, we had a tumor growth inhibition model where there was a delay between the application of the drug and uh, cell death of tumor cells. And in this case, uh, you remember there was a Simeone model and the Jumbi model, um, you know, uh, we, uh, we applied a transit compartment model. And uh, that's actually also what we going to apply here, or we just take it from Freeback, of course. So this is a Freeback model. Uh, it um, uses the transition, tra transit compartment uh, to model the delay, the delay chain, if you will. And it has, it has kind of a semi-physiological character since the transit compartment uh, shall mimic the maturation of pro proliferating cells in the bone marrow. Uh, that passes through stages of precursor cells until they reach the mature stage of circulating leukocytes. Uh, in this uh, literature, uh, the Freeberg shows three transit compartments. These are the three transit compartments. Uh, and um, this is, you, you know, a, a graphical depiction of the model. Um, you can see here the differential equation that makes up the model. And the most complex part of the model is actually the description of the proliferating cells, the compartment with the proliferating cells. So here we have a first-order uh, first uh, rate constant describing the production of the proliferating cells. Um, and uh, this is then combined with uh, um, with a drug effect, right? And, and this drug, drug effect is a simple linear relationship between uh, the effect and the concentration, E-drug 
equals slope times c. So we just need to estimate the slope uh, to um, put that into to the model. Now we also have to implement a way to deal with the rebound of circulating um, cells that we saw in the exploratory plot. And here it is, is modeled with a, with a feedback mechanism, and Freeberg uses the ratio of the estimated leukocyte baseline count, the CERC zero, um, with the um, with the actual uh, circulating uh, leukocyting leukocyte cell count. And that's at any time point. And this ratio was further exponentiated uh, with another parameter gamma. And then we have, um, you know, the the the, uh, the feedback actually, uh, you know, um, acts on the proliferation, so it's it's really on on acting on K in times pro. And the proliferating cells uh, then are being transferred to the first transit compartment via first order rate constant K T R, uh, and that is given here minus K T R times pro. Um, the, this is the same, I mean, rate constant is used throughout the delay chain, so the transit one, two, and three compartments until it reaches, you know, the final compartments of the circulating leukocytes. But when it's reaching the um, final compartment, uh, the cells then get elim eliminated uh, with first order elimination rate constant K out. So you see this here, the, these are the changes of the amounts or the, the cell counts in the transit compartment is just using the same rate constants with these uh, differences in the parentheses from the previous and the uh, actual uh, compartment. So in the, in the last, the circulating uh, uh, cell compartment, uh, these get eliminated with K out. So this is the model, and you can now think of these differential equations, how to put them into PML code. And then we go back, go to, to the next stage. Here is actually the, the Freeberg model in PML code. You know, we don't need the, the built-in options or the graphical model builder, because this is something uh, that you cannot easily pick from, from any of, of those graphical or built-in options. So we are starting right away with uh, with the PM with the textual model, but you've seen the differential equations from the previous slide, and you know it's it's much like uh, the same uh, kind of equations that you need to put into PML. So most of the code should be familiar to you now. So let's start. The first line is a, a PK model. So and this is actually uh, capacity limited. That's why we should chose the or Freeback. Uh, chose the Michaelis Menten equation for this. So this is an, and the Michaelis Menten equation has some parameters, Vmax, Km, and also we have to scale the, concentra the amount uh, um, with a volume to get the concentration. This is shown here. And uh, the fixed effect initial estimates are here, shown here, and these are actually frozen. So we'll, what we'll do in the demo is we'll uh, do a separate PK modeling object uh, to uh, identify those parameters, and then we can uh, take those over to the PD model and, and freeze those in order to really just to focus on the PD parameters. So this was the first line, the PK part. Now the next lines are all for the, um, for the PD model, for the transit compartment model. This is the, actually the complex differential, differential equation for the proliferating cells. As you see, Kn times prol times this. This is obviously the uh, um, uh, PKPD relationship, one minus E drug times, here is now in a feedback loop, uh, the baseline uh, divided by the uh, actual circulating cell count, exponentiated with gamma minus the transit rate constant KTR times the amount in the proliferating um, compartment. And then here the differential equations for the different uh, transit compartments, followed by the differential equation for the uh, circulating cell count department, circulating cell department uh, compartment. Sorry. This is known. I mean, uh, this is our dose point. This is an IV bolus dose. 
uh, this is a scaling of the amounts to, with the volume to get to concentrations. FB, this is actually just the parameter that I take in. You know, when you want to get some information, like we used to call them secondary parameter, but you can call them just FB as a parameter and you want to see the output later on. I'll show you in the demo how you can get to those. I mean, you can come up with these kind of equations, just put them into the PML code and uh, see the outcome later uh, when you do the fitting in, in, a, in a different table. Here's actually the PKPT relationship, the e drug equation, e drug equals slope times C. We've seen that. And uh, now this next two lines are for our uh, residual error model. And um, this is uh, a multiplicative uh, uh, residual error model that you've shown here, circle, the circulating uh, cell count times one plus e plus EPS, and EPS is uh, initially estimates is 10 percent, 0.1. Now, um, then uh, that's for the PD model and the residual error model. The next five lines are that's what we you know we we talked about it in the last session, the sequence statement, because uh, we have to initialize. Uh, the compartments, the transit compartments, proliferating and circulating cells, uh, because they are not starting at zero. So in this case, we use the sequence statement to set them to the baseline value of the circulating cells, circ zero. And uh, what the sequence um, does is, you remember that maybe if we want to assign a value at the start of the process at time equals zero, we just use this as it is here. So we just uh, set, initializing all these values, which is in our case uh, 15 billion cells per liter for each of those compartments. Now, uh, these are, this is a part of the fixed effects. Uh, as I said, I mean, the PK parameters are all frozen. It's coming from the PK model. Uh, and for the PD parameters, uh, you can take 15. This is actually um, something you can get out of the exploratory plot, baseline value, when you start with the treatment. Uh, K in, K out, uh, both are set to 1, gamma 0 0.3, the transition rate constant to 1, and the slope to 0 0.01. I can show you in the demo um, how we deal with this, but um, we've, I think I've shown it last time in our last session how you can use, for example, the NCA object with the um, drug type uh, of uh, the drug model, a type of um, NCA object, to get to those slopes uh, of the you know decreasing arm and the increasing arm to get some some initial values for K in K out. In this case, you know we just keep it as as, as, as a, with with one, and you will see within the initial estimates uh, in the demo that this fits quite nicely. So, okay, let's start with the demo. So let me share Phoenix. Okay, here we are. So what do we have as data? Uh, we have a dosing table. These are just three treatment groups. The fourth was just placebo control group. But I guess for this little information, we actually don't need a dosing sheet. Uh, this is a PK data, and as I said in the beginning, you know, I've just uh, used, uh, digitized the data from the uh, literature reference, so um, this is a value that I came up with. It's, it's not accurate, right? But I think, you know, if you've got six measurements per time point, um, uh, roughly on average, so it, it gives us a, a good, good uh, representation of the underlying data set. So let's have a look at the plot that you can see, XY plot. This is our PK plot. And, okay, this is it. We don't need the lines. Let me, in my want to show it in a semi-log scale, you see it's just a single slope. And this we can model with a very simple one compartmental model. So we send the same data set to a Phoenix model and say this is our PK model. 
Okay. We don't need um, the population. You know, this is red data. You could just simply take the naive food method for this. Um, we stick to clearance parameterization, intravenous absorption. One compartment should be enough. And uh, capacity limited means saturating. So we just need to. Uh, this is a model, actually, the graphical depiction. When I put in saturating, it will change. You know, the elimination part with uh, from clearance to Michaelis Menten, and this is also shown here in the uh, differential equation. That's it for uh, for the model description. Uh, dosing, we need some dose. Uh, so we said 127 mix per kick at time zero. That we can put in here. And now we need to get to initial estimates. So we get to this. This second, I think we've, yeah, we need to do the mapping in main. Time to time, Kong to C ops. Let me switch back. So initial estimates, now it should, should work. Yeah, here's the data. Actually, because it's just such a short time span, we just need maybe three hours. Um, typical volume is one km. Yes, we can start increasing the max to a certain value, something like maybe this, and then come to km. I mean, this is something where you can spend a lot of time trying to fit this to lock and the lock semi lock display is maybe easier to do yeah uh, i mean you don't need to get to a close fit here this should be good enough i mean we just take these as initial values and the algorithm should do the rest so we just execute and then we've got, uh, you know, this is a fit of the data. Actually, one thing that I typically do, and I mean, because um, uh, there are not too many data points, um, I usually take, uh, uh, um, let another table be calculated, which also gives me um, time points in a more dense uh, resolution. Uh, so the sequence statement means, I mean, I want to have uh, calculated values for concentration, predicted values for concentration between zero and two hours, time interval of 0 0.1. And we want to have uh, as observations C ops, ops, C ops, and as variables C our predicted concentration. And let me just execute once again. This is fast enough. And then we've got this table where you've got more data points that you can then send to a plot object, x, y plot, time, c, ops, c. For c, ops, we don't want to see a line. And for the predicted, we don't want to see markers. That's it. And OK, this looks much the same. But anyway, this would be our plot. And you see it tries to really to fit to through the data points. Let's have a short look at the theta table, the estimated parameters. And actually, one thing, you know, this is something when you look at this, um, you might want to change the residual error structure from additive to multiplicative, in this case, 0 0.1, to get to Hopefully, better fit. This looks more like the values in the literature example. In the literature example, they've used a the more complex residual error model, but the multiplicative is, is good enough. So we just stick to those. There's some high variability on these two parameters, K and Vmax, but that's what, what it is. I mean, if we check the curve once again, this is good. This looks good. If you look at this plot, we need to re-execute. This looks good as well. So we come closer to the middle point here. So this is our um, 
Okay, fit. fit plot. This is our PK part. Now we can uh, start modeling our uh, PD data. So we first plot the data. And this looks just, oops, X, Y, like this. We don't need a line. But okay, so you see this curvature here that we saw in, on the slides. This is our PD plot. And let's send this also to a Phoenix model object. And this will be our PKPD model. Actually, it's our Freeberg model. So um, here as well, we don't need a population. This is red data. But what we need actually is the model itself. And as I said, we don't go through the built-in options or the graphical model. We just go directly to the textual model. OK, yes, we go to the textual model. And this is it. We don't need this text. And you know, I can spend hours now in writing the PML code. This is not what I'm going to do. I'm just, I just have the textual model. You know, the file that I will upload to the user form after the event, I just take this text, copy it, and paste it into this one, into this box. OK, that's it. So, and this is identical to the uh, code that I've shown on the slides. Okay. Okay, so this is it. Um, we just need to map the data. Time is time, E is E ops. We have dosing data, which is again 127 at time zero. Right. And uh, now we go to initial estimates. Okay, this is our initial estimates. And these are the um, PD parameters that we can change. These are the PK parameters, which are frozen, so we don't need to change here. So the baseline here, you can change it to different values. K in and K out, you see there's something going on, pretty yeah, strong changes here, K in. Gamma, maybe you can put it a bit stronger. I mean, all this changes, I mean, it's it's better with a one, maybe with slope, it's maybe shallower or deeper. But that should be okay. So I guess uh, roughly the the initial parameters that we've, we've, we've given in the code should be good enough, so we just need to execute and see how the fit is. Let's have a look. And this is a fit of the data. It's really trying to uh, go through the middle of those uh, clouds of data points. So I think it does a good job. Um, what I'm typically doing here as well is create a table. So in this case, we need from zero to maybe, I mean, this is a little bit extrapolating. You know, we only have data points until 25, but why not uh, extending it a bit to, to 100 and say for each day uh, one calculation and we just take, uh, now uh, what we want to see is actually the circulating cells, maybe the, uh, no, no the, with the prol proliferating cells, the um, uh, amount in the first transit compartment, and the second, in the third, and obviously also in circ. And then we had this, equa this equation for the feedback uh, in the model. We can also write it out in, in this additional table. So let's do this. And here we have this. So we have the time, proliferating cell count, 
and the individual ones on the other compartments, and the feedback uh, expression, which fluctuates between less than one and a little bit above one, over one. So, and I think the fit should be good enough, yeah, still. Uh, the theta values here, these are frozen, so no change. Um, and here, if you look at the CV percent, this is a rather sharp fit. You can also look at a few diagnostic sheets, maybe, just to check, I mean, whether this fit is really good. So we look at the individual weighted residuals against the predicted values. And typically, you want to see, you know, horizontal lines of red and blue, uh, low S curves, which is the case here. The same versus time, and you know this is really uh, almost perfect, perfect diagnostics. So I guess we can stick with the model. Let's do one thing. Let's plot the predicted values. So X Y plot. So we've got time, and we want to see proliferating tier one, tier two, and circ. And this is a curve that we see. We don't need markers. So I'll just uncheck the markers for all the curves. And this shows really, you know, how the um, second, the leukocyte count, uh, you know, fluctuates around its baseline value. And these, the upper ones, are just from the uh, non-mature stages. Okay, this is um, the Freeberg model. Um, this, uh, the subtitle of this presentation was how to determine the number of transit compartments. In this case, uh, you know, we had we already started with with three transit compartments. So we might want to try maybe two and four, just to you know to see. I mean. Uh, what are the changes if we decrease or increase this number? So let's copy this model and paste it back, and we call this maybe the TR2 Freeberg model. And what we need to change here is very simple. Um, we can ignore this line where we uh, have the differential equation for the tr third transit compartment. We just go from the second transit compartment into the circulating cell compartment, and that's all we need to do. And run this model once again. Okay, this is it. Also, a nice fit, much the same as before, right? No big change. What about our theta values? These are the parameters, a little bit lower baseline here, a little bit lower K in, I guess. Mm, little bit, it's a little higher precision on, uh, a lower precision on, on the estimates, but maybe just very minor. So this looks good. Let's have a look at the diagnostic plots. Is there something? Up is here, no, not really. Also here, not. So let's do this, copy this once again and paste it for the TR4 part. This is our four transit Freeberg model. And what do we need here to change? Obviously, we need to put in here a four. And what we have to do here is come on. We have to copy this transit compartment, paste it back in here, and call it TR4. And we take this one as input, and this is output. Okay, that's it. No, not, not just. We also need to initialize the value here properly. Okay, let's see. TR4, that's it. Run it. And see the outcome. Okay, here we are. Much the same fit once again. Not a big difference. Looking at theta, yes, the baseline is a little bit higher. 
also K in. So the values change, change in the number of transit compartments. Oh, but the precision is good. So what can we do from here? We can just compare the output here overall, maybe. Let's start with the TS3. So let's compare all the overall sheets. We send this overall sheet to a data append worksheet where we append all this to all the three different outputs from the models. So we select here the feedback model overall sheet. These are, the overall sheet contains the diagnostics. Come on. And the same we do for the TR4. And ready. Here we go. So this is the output, minus 2 LL. We see not a big change. Maybe TR2 is a little bit worse compared to the other two. And there's a slight advantage for the Freeberg model with the three transit compartments, but uh, this, this is not significant. So, so it's, it's really not um, really a big difference between those. Okay, that's how we deal with the assessment of the transit compartments. I guess this is concludes the demo. Let me go back to the slides. Um, here, once again, the results. This is the output uh, from our FIT, which really follows uh, the curvature of the data points. Uh, so, this is such as that the model does really a good job in describing the data. And when we are looking at the theta table, these are the final estimates with a very low CV percent. So overall, this is actually a very good outcome of the modeling uh, exercise. To summarize, so we today we've implemented a well-known model, uh, the Freeberg model in Phoenix Binon Lin. Uh, this model uh, shows a linear PKPT relationship and uh, uh, concentration of the drug uh, in its effect, and it's, it's semi-physiologic, so it's uh, able to describe to a certain extent the biology behind the effect by uh, the transit compartments mimicking uh, the maturation of the proliferation of the cells. And we've also implemented a feedback mechanism and a feedback loop to be able to deal with the rebound of the effect. Finally, we have tested three different models in order to find out what's the best number of uh, transit compartments and what would give the best fit. And we concluded, although it's not really significant, but the best number would be three in this case. So that's it for today's uh, topic. Let's start with uh, Q&A. Oops, come on. Most of the yeah, Q and A. So what do we have? Um, actually, yes. Oh, uh, I learned that um, initial values for differential equation need to be in one sequence statement. Here, each is in separate one. Which way is right? Yeah, uh, it works either way, I guess. Um, this is actually a very good point. Um, uh, you know, we use the sequence statement to initialize the transit compartments. Um, this brings me to the point that there is um, a transit statement, you know, you can define transit compartments in one uh, PML code statement. And I didn't use it here, although I could could have done it, but there's one um, thing that uh, prevented this, me, uh, you know, that uh, the one reason why I, why I didn't, didn't do that, because uh, for transit compartments, uh, typically the, they are initialized with, with a zero value. So um, that's and and we 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 know that uh, for these uh, different uh, um, cell compartments, they need to start at at a certain value, at a baseline value. So this is why I didn't use it. Um, can you please explain the sequence statement and its applic applicability again? 
you know, we've covered this now for the third time, the sequence statement, so there are um, a lot of uh, explanations already in the previous session, but the sequence statement, you know, the, 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 all the statements in the PML code, uh, uh, you know, happen at the same time, you know, they, they are not sequential in any way, you know, they are valid all the time. But sometimes uh, when you deal with, in this case, response time data, uh, you want to change, you know, at, at a certain time point, you want to change a certain value. And this is a way the sequence statement sets in. So you can uh, start with a sequence statement, and this uh, starts with every subject in your data at time zero. And uh, then you can, you know, assign, for example, initial values. But what you can also do is maybe you want to assign this value at a later stage, maybe after 10 hours. Then you could use the sequence statement in combination with the sleep 10 statement in order to tell the program, you know, after 10 time units, uh, please assign this value uh, to this, this, this parameter and so forth. So it's really t trying to break out of the uh, uh, general code, general PML code, to do something at a specific point in time. How do you obtain initial value estimates? I think we've shown that uh, in the um, session on nonlinear clearance. I'm not, don't remember uh, which one it was, but I'll, I'll respond to that uh, maybe in, uh, in, 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 in the user forum in the Q&A part. Some versions of the feedback model have a mixture model for the baseline neutrophil count. Is there any information about when the mixture modeling will be available in the model? I guess here I need to pass. I think I need to do some research on this question. So I will get back to this when I post the response on the user form. Uh, what factors have to choose the number of compartments? I guess what what we've seen here, uh, the transit. Uh, I mean, you mean the transit compartment number of transit compartments. Actually, you know, this is a model fit, right? I mean, it's 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 a diagnostic that uh, drives this decision, and that's what I showed by appending the overall worksheets to compare them side by side. Uh, the, can the models be compared with a model comparer as well? Uh, unfortunately, not in this case, uh, because as I said, I mean, we've got red data, so we don't have individual uh, subjects, uh, subject IDs uh, with the data. And as, as, as you know, this is literature data. If I've just digitized the data so I couldn't, you know, relate uh, the, the, the data points to, a, to, to an individual animal, if you will. But uh, if you have um, uh, animal IDs or subject IDs, you can do the same modeling with the population uh, mode on, and in that case, you can use a model comparer. It's not available in, in non-population um, uh, mode because typically you get uh, um, uh, you don't have, have enough information to compare this. And if you use a naive, mo naive food model, you get lots of individual uh, parameter estimates that is not easily compared with the, with the model comparer. Yes, that's a good, good point. Based on the little difference between models, shouldn't one shows two compartments rather than three according to the parsimony principle? Yes, correct. This is this is the right conclusion here, yeah. and uh, you know I I stick I, I stick to the to the three compartments because, <laughs> because I wanted to reproduce a, a literature example, and you know may, I may not have you know all the data uh, available for the for those decisions. You know it, it's just trying to be as close as possible to to a literature example because and that is really in our next sessions that we are planning. Uh, where we uh, want to see interesting uh, examples from you, uh, suggested by you, uh, where we want to see, I mean, how good we are in reproducing what's what's been published. But in principle, you're right with, with the parsimony principle. How are your conclusions that it shows best fit, given that all three models show good fit and lower? Yeah, yeah, that's, that comes to the same point. Yes, that's exactly right. Slope of what uh, and, you know. This is a, this is just you know the effect 
uh, yeah, you know, you want to exert an effect on the count of uh, circulating leukocytes, right? And this is driven by, you know, a slope factor, which we just called, called slope, and that is multiplied by the concentration at that time point, right? It's, it's a linear relationship, E drug equals slope times C. Okay, in the relation plot of 100 sick returns the baseline, does not, does this mean drug has a permanent effect? Um, no, as a, this was in, uh, you know, th there was the assumption that the proliferating cells would have the same value as the circulating leukocytes, which might not be true, right? So um, it, it might have a completely different baseline. It's just the circulating baseline. This is what we can measure. Um, that this goes back to the to the baseline. So the, the other compartments um, can have a, a different baseline. But just for the initialization of the model, we say, okay, uh, let's assume all the um, cell counts are, are equal. Okay, that's all the questions we have for now. You may want to uh, add so, to, to those questions if you want, and um, I will. Uh, uh, take them on and and, um, and write uh, responses to them and uh, load it up to our user forum uh, later today or tomorrow. So this was a Q&A. Uh, maybe just um, before we close, um, uh, we uh, just a few comments on our PML, PML school once again. This, as I said, this is the last session of the series that we've planned for when we started last year. Um, up to now, we have now uh, been given 20 sessions covering a wide area of the PKBD space. You've got now access to all the materials in our user forum, and you see the link to it here on the slide, on the bottom of the slide. This is a slide deck, the recorded sessions, and as you see on the right-hand side, we've also uploaded all these recorded sessions to our YouTube channel, and you can reach it uh, using those links at the bottom. Um, what happens next? Um, as, we, as I said in the beginning, we will start a new series of PML school webinars this autumn. And before that, um, we are actually going into a summer break, August and September. And we are planning for six sessions until the end of the year. So we think this will be roughly two sessions each month, October through December. And what are we planning to show? So this is really up to you. I mean, I would like to encourage you, the audience, to participate in those, those sessions. I mean, either by suggesting an interesting model from the literature, you know, something like I've presented today. And you may, be, uh, uh, you, you may want to present this model on your own, but uh, you don't need to. I mean, we can also cover this for you. And I completely understand that there are restrictions in companies for scientists to disclose their work in the public. But perhaps if we focus on literature examples, we might circumvent this restriction at least um, a little bit. And here we, actually we don't want to leave you alone. If you have an interesting example and you may not have finished it yet, or perhaps you have not even started, but you wanted to do it, we are there to help. So um, please drop me a note and we can get in touch to finish it for a potential presentation in a web webinar event uh, at the PML school. And apart from the um, User presentations, I will also present work that we did behind the scenes um, to extend our model library, PML model library. We have more than 100 non-MEM models. Non-MEM is another very popular modeling program. Uh, and those models uh, we want to translate into PML code. So far, we have up to 20 models ready, of which most of them have already been posted to our user forum. And uh, in the uh, PML school webinar, um, we want to show you how we did that. So every model, model comes with a slide deck comparing the different codes, NMTRAN, that's the language for non-MEM, and PML for the Phoenix uh, model code. And uh, during the demo, we are setting up those models in Phoenix, and we will run both the non-MEM model and the Phoenix model. And uh, at the end, we are comparing the results between those models, and we hope this is interesting to you. But let us know. I mean, we are eager to get your feedback on this. 
Okay, this is the end of today's session. Um, let me say a big thank you to all of you for your interest in this series and uh, your contributions during the webinars and after that. It has a, been a wonderful experience to run this school over the first year, and uh, I would be pleased if you would stay with us for another year. So thank you, goodbye, and you may want to disconnect now. Thanks.